and welcome to this webinar today. Um, our webinar is Planet versus Microfibers Fashion's Gigantic Little Problem. My name is Shelley Rogers. I'm the coordinator of Fashion for the Earth at EarthDay.org. And we are so pleased to be co-hosting today's webinar with Carrie Banigan, who is the managing director of the Public Foundation and the co-founder of the United Nations Fashion and Lifestyle Network, a joint initiative of the Fashion Impact Fund and the United Nations Office for Partnerships. Today, we are honored to have three distinguished guests with us who play in life multiple roles, but I guess you could say collectively, they are scientists, explorers, thinkers, teachers, advisors, and inventors. Our guests are recognized widely for their deep knowledge about the environment and how the materials utilized by the fashion industry have impacted the earth. A couple of things just on behalf of Earth Day I'd like to mention. Almost 70% of the clothes we wear today are made of plastics from the oil industry. The microfibers that break off from these synthetic material, materials like polyester, for example, are also identifiable as microplastics. Today, 35% of the microplastics in the ocean are from our clothing. Microfibers are a bit, I think, like climate change used to be you know, which was it somewhere else? It's not my backyard. I mean, does this thing really exist? Microfibers are of course microscopic. We can't see them. So I mean, how bad is this really? Do they really exist? I can't see them. Well, microfibers exist big time. We are sending as many as 500,000 tons of these into our oceans every single year. But to make it personal, for everyone, microfibers have been discovered in our hearts, our lungs, our intestines, placentas, mother's milk, and in babies. The thing that got to me, I guess, is sometimes one fact gets to you, was in 2022 at, in a study at the Free University in Amsterdam, plastics were found in 80% of the blood of those tested. One plastic found, and I believe 50% of the time, was polyethylene terephthalate the hard version of which is your water bottle and the soft version of which is your polyester garment. So the problem is not somewhere over there, does it exist? These are actually inside of us. This is a threat that we must face because we continue to buy and trash 100 billion garments every year and in between we wash them, dry them and wear them continually. Today, our guests will explain microfibers, where they have been discovered and how they got there and what steps are moving us toward the changes necessary to turn this toxic tide. And now without further ado, thank you to our co-sponsor, Carrie, and over to you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you for everyone joining us here today. We're going to have an extremely insightful conversation. First, I would like to welcome um, our speakers. We are joined today by Dr. Amanda Parks, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at Pangaea, Dr. Peter Ross, Senior Scientist and Director of Water Pollution at the Raincoast Conservation Foundation, and Crystal Moodywood, Founder and Principal Consultant of Materia Evolve. I just wanna say a big thank you to all taking the time and everything you're gonna share with us today. Before I delve into the questions, I would actually like to call upon each of our speakers just to share a little bit about their background, their journey, and what got them to here today. So Amanda, I'd like to start with you, please. Sure, thank you so much, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so yes, I'm Amanda Parks. I'm currently the Chief Innovation Officer at Pangaea, which is known publicly as a fashion brand, but we actually have a whole back end of R&D and B2B uh, research happening. Uh, my background is as a scientist, hybrid material science, um, computer science, which means I worked on a lot of processes like biofabrication, et cetera. Um, and before that, I was a mechanical engineer. So all different kinds of systems thinking, uh, process design has gone into what we're doing. And now the real work um, that we're trying to you know, put together for the future of our brand and the fashion industry is a material philosophy, which I've named high-tech naturalism, which is really where we're looking at places where there's an abundance in nature, um, and then you know things things like um, you know waste or 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 weeds or that kinds of things, agricultural waste, and um, using the highest levels of science and technology to augment uh, those materials. And um, and so basically, this idea of using science and engineering to in in conjunction with sustainability um, and not kind of antithetical to it, which was kind of how a lot of engineering training happened. So thank you. 
Brilliant. Thank you for that. I look forward to getting into our questions shortly. Peter? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, delighted to be here. My name is uh, Peter Ross. I'm a research scientist and I'm program director for Healthy Waters at Raincoast Conservation Foundation uh, in uh, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I've been working for 30, if not 35 years, looking for all of the problems that I can find. And that is the bad news out there in the environment, the bad news in the form of, for example, uh, very high levels of PCBs and killer whales here in the Northeastern Pacific, to petroleum hydrocarbons uh, from oil spills, to microplastics in, in zooplankton, uh, as well as exotic things like cocaine and pharmaceuticals in floodwaters following a devastating flood here in British Columbia in late 2021. So I'm out there sometimes uh, referred to as uh, Dr. Bad News, but the beauty in that from my perspective is discovering bad news actually empowers us to create good news in the form of solutions, action and restoration. Uh, and so I, I hope that uh, at the end of today, the, the, the public here will go away feeling uh, a little bit more energized because we do need some energy out there. So delighted to be here today uh, and I'll uh, hand it over, uh, hand it back to you, Carrie. thanks. Thank you so much. And Crystal? Yeah, hello everyone. Crystal Moodywood, founder and principal consultant of Materi Evolve. We're based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, uh, my background, I'm almost 20 years in textile development, really the bulk of my career, spending time with all the parts and pieces of supply chain and with a focus on sustainability. Um, the first part of my career, I spent on the corporate side in a materials developer role, um, getting to, to work with new green chemistry, new material types, really looking at performance and testing and how we evaluate our materials and their benefits for us. But then also layering sustainability on top of that and thinking through life cycle impacts, envir key environmental issues, and really trying to figure out how to holistically address all the things that we want to see in our clothing the fashion, the fit, as well as the performance, in addition to not harming nature in the process and really looking at benefiting it through that process. Um, what, what that journey has led me to do is actually start my own business, uh, this consultancy, Materi Evolve, um, about eight years ago um, and work independently and, and be able to work with a variety of different folks um, in, in many different uh, company and organization types, uh, I feel so privileged to have been able to work with scientists and, and folks that are really on the leading edge and thinking about environmental issues and bringing those back to textile systems. Boy, we are in for an interesting conversation between you three, all your findings. And like Peter said, getting the bad news so we can then actually start focusing on the solutions. So again, thank you to the three of you for joining us today. So Peter, I'm going to um, start with you. You're an internationally recognized ocean pollution expert, as well as sharing widely its impact of pollution on wildlife. Your work has resulted in very important discoveries and studies and toxicity in the ocean, including the one that concerns us here today for this conversation. Now, when you were the Vice President of Research with OceanWise at the Vancouver Aquariums, you actually led expeditions to the Arctic and the Northeast Pacific to look at microfiber pollution. But first, before we delve into all of that, could you please set the stage for us, especially those who don't know, and explain what microfibers are exactly? And I know that we've got some slides here to show that hopefully the visual will guide us through that too. So over to you. Uh, thanks, Carrie. Yeah, I think um, uh, the... The first statement I'd like to make is that uh, based on the collective works of scientists and conservation mm -hmm. organizations and government agencies around the world, we can very confidently say that microfibers are everywhere. Microfibers are everywhere. Defining microfibers, Carrie, uh, really depends on who you are. Uh, we may have a, a mix of natural fibers from plants or trees that, that are found out there. We might have natural fibers that are deliberately designed by humans, by people in the form of, for example, cotton uh, or, uh, or other materials from, from mostly from plants. And we may have microfibers uh, that are commercially made from petroleum products 
Uh, and we can think of things like ropes, curtains, carpets, and textiles. And so there are a lot of different ways in which you might look at microfibers and or define them. But for the sake of uh, today, simply put, uh, we generally refer to microfibers as man-made fibers. That's what science is looking for. And we, we have to rule out the natural fibers that we run into that are part of the natural world. There are less than five millimeters in size. That's technically what scientists have agreed to around the world. So typically that means long in the way of uh, fibers. Uh, and think of the broader category of microplastics. There are other plastic pollutants in the ocean, but they don't look like fibers. And typically the fibers that we're running into, uh, along with um, other teams around the world, uh, have, have them as uh, having a diameter of 10 to 15 microns. So they're very thin, they're long, they're different colors, they're blue, black, green, yellow, clear, uh, et cetera. And we have been able to confirm uh, that they are synthetic by virtue of having the technology called an FTIR, uh, Fourier transform in, uh, infrared uh, spectrometer that allows us to, to basically uh, establish that these are indeed uh, synthetic uh, and in most cases are polyester. In the range of 75% of the fibers that we're running into uh, in the Pacific Ocean and Arctic Ocean, uh, we're talking polyester. So polyester uh, with an average uh, diameter of about 14 microns very consistent with the, the size and, and properties of uh, textile-based uh, uh, origins. So found all over the world, in our oceans, in our lakes, in our snow, in our mountains, in the air, in animals of all kinds and shapes, and in people. So we are uh, in a current state whereby microfibers have basically enveloped the, the biosphere uh, and created a uh, living experiment for us sci scientists to monitor and track and understand. But we're late in the game. These fibers have been around for quite a while. Uh, and unfortunately, science is playing catch up to basically uh, provide the evidence that will allow us to better protect uh, animals and people uh, into the future. So that's a bit of a backgrounder on what micro microfibers are and where they're coming from. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And I know it's a lot to take in. And that's why as we continue to go through this conversation, um, our three speakers here today will break down more, share and give us a deeper understanding of also how this is happening and uh, relatable to our everyday lives. So, um, Amanda, I would uh, love to speak to you, and I know that we're going to show a video, but um, before we play that, I just want to really set the tone with you for a moment here that Pangaea is creating sustainable materials that are based on scientific breakthroughs, including coats made of flower down, which for those watching is an insulation made of flowers that replaces the down. Now, Amanda, you work with fruit fibers, ink made of carbon waste, and materials even made from seaweed and microalgae. But if through all of this, you've also formed partnerships, and one of these is your partnerships with MTIX, an invention that through its MLSE process can prevent garments or textiles from shedding microfibers. And for this innovation, there was actually Pangaea won the Microfiber Innovation Challenge in 2022. Now, we're going to play a short video now that demonstrates the invention. And then you please tell us more about this. And I think, especially for the audience, talk to us about MTIX and then also about the process. Yeah. I've always loved fashion. I was one of those little girls that absolutely was into trends and colors, but also happened to be really good at math and science. And luckily, no one told me that I couldn't do those two things together. I come from tech, I'm a scientist and a technologist, and working with large technology companies like Intel or Google, they all have a lot of internal R&D and they're designing the future of their own, own industry. When I moved into the fashion industry, I was surprised to find that wasn't happening inside of big brands. I'm very worried about the long-term effects of microfibers and what we don't even know about what's out there long-term. It's like one of those terrifying things to consider as a scientist. 
Traditional synthetics, when they're washed, the surface of the textile, you'll see kind of little hairs that start to stick up. Those are the pieces of the fiber that start to break off and create the tiny microfibers. It's a design problem. Hegaya is a material science brand who kind of manifests publicly as a fashion brand. We are looking for across the board solutions around the future of sustainability for fashion. Pengaya has come together with MTX for the Microfiber Innovation Challenge, and MTX is a, an amazing technology company that has created uh, something called MLSE, Multiplex Laser Surface Enhancement, that basically mixes plasma, gas, and laser to be able to create a change in the surface finish of a textile, create a much smoother surface that is like sealed where the fibers themselves all stick together and do not tend to break off in the same way during washing. It just took us a while to understand the, the depth and breadth of what was possible. The first step of the process is to do an analysis of the fabric itself, which you do with a scanning electron microscope. Um, to understand the quality of the fabric and the composition. And then from there, that outputs data which feeds into the algorithm. Based on what the surface is made of and the quality of the surface, then, we, then there's a customized algorithm which goes on top to then treat that. We were so enthralled by this idea that there was a solution that could apply to many different textile treatments that we were looking to solve without chemistry, that there could be a singular solution, a, a singular system. It can be inside of, of any textile production factory and could be just the last step of finishing. The solution that we're working on actively is one that kind of meets the industry where it's at. We're gonna take the fashion industry by storm with this technology because once it's doing all of these things that are done in different places with different chemistries and all different cycles, we can do it all in one place. That's gonna be a major breakthrough that I think, I think they're gonna be a little bit shocked. There's not as much emphasis put on innovation and, and technology inside of fashion. There's very much a focus on craft and aesthetics, as I think there should be. But, you know, we wanted to show that there's a way that we can have these two things work together, that they're not at odds with each other, and that the fashion industry can move forward progressively without losing so much of the things we love about it. Great. So, um... Thanks for, thanks for letting me play that, explain it all kind of somewhat concisely, but it is tricky because we're talking about a solution, multiplex laser surface enhancement, which is an invisible solution to an invisible problem. So, <laughs> so trying, to, trying to discuss this uh, more broadly is definitely a challenge, but what we're, what we're looking at is this machine that has this breakthrough technology that uses laser plasma physics. Basically think of, um, you know, it's a mixture, a programmable mixture of gases put into a chamber, um, and then basically a, a laser runs across the textile, which creates this, this surface enhancement. So it is invisible to feel, um, touch, you know, everything on, um, on the fabric itself. But the important thing to recognize is that when we came together with MTIX, we were actually looking, we weren't actually focused on microfibers. This technology was invented to do all different kinds of treatments to textiles. So water repellency, um, preparing for dye, all of these things that are normally done with very toxic chemicals and a lot of water and energy, this is that solution. And it turns out that microfiber uh, mitigation is something that can be added into these treatments. Um, so that's what's kind of, that's what's really exciting about this is that it comes um, kind of in conjunction with other things we're already doing to uh, prepare and treat our textiles. This is incredible. Thank you so much. And also, I just want to share, please know um, for the viewers that if you want to put questions here in the comments um, for either of the speakers that you can, and we will be getting to these at the end. If you want to do it as we go through and each of the speakers are touching on certain things, we will absolutely look to address what we can. So thank you. So Crystal, over to you. Now, you began your career as a materials developer for one of the largest global apparel, footwear, and equipment conglomerates in the world. And you quickly moved up into a materials innovation role. That This then, in turn, gave you the opportunity to work deep in materials sustainability. And with that, also alongside a global network of textile innovators. But you have now ultimately left and you formed your own company, as you said. I think it was eight years ago you shared that. And so I'd love to know what changed your trajectory with that. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Oh, and Amanda, I just um I'm so happy to hear about the the program we were able to connect earlier uh, through the microfiber innovation challenge. And it's just that 
you know, that multi-layered solution when you think holistically about a solution for a problem. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I spent uh, about a decade in corporate materials development. I thought I was in my dream role. Um, sustainability was integrated into every materials platform I had my hands in. And the more I worked in that role and with these amazing innovators, the more I could see that being behind a, a particular corporation wasn't the right place for me and my skill set and really where my passion was. Um, I was guiding the development of green chemical alternatives, new systems to support aspirational sustainability goals, and developing new processes for creating new material alternatives. Many focused on taking today's commonly used synthetics and making them better. And I think it was at that point that I realized, I mean, there was even a point where one of the leaders I was working with told me that cotton wasn't sexy enough. And it really took me to this place where if I was really thinking holistically about systems change and the environment at the forefront, I couldn't see a way in a, a traditional materials innovation role at that time. I mean, there weren't the Pangaeas of the world yet <laughs> um, to really develop in the way that I wanted to see the communities that needed to be talking to each other to develop systems with nature in mind. Around 2015, I was completing a project collaboration with the nonprofit Fiber Shed. If you don't know them, look them up. Um, it completely opened my eyes to the incredible world of natural fibers. It feels weird to say that, but I kind of grew up in the performance and outdoor industry with performance as the lens and never, you know, never really looked to the natural fiber world for performance materials. Um, and, and also through that program, I really um, started to learn about the power of soil and land management and soil forward textile systems, the, the soil to soil life cycle as Fiber Shed uh, so easily coined for all of us to think about. Um, after working in, after feeling the weight of environmental our environmental imperative, I couldn't see a path in my current role that would allow me to dive deep enough into sustainability so I made a change. Um, I also did a soul search and realized how important ocean science was to me. And I thought I would be a marine biologist by now. And so I really started deep diving into microfiber pollution. I had to figure out what I could do about the issue. Uh, shortly after I joined a research expedition with the nonprofit Five Gyres in Southeast Asia, they were conducting or we were conducting research on plastic pollution and I was absolutely floored about at the waste we saw, even in the most remote islands where no one lived, uh, floating waste, waste uh, that had washed up on remote islands and tangled itself in mangroves, um, and even the waste they were burning because they didn't have any other way to really manage that waste. And that was what I could see. Meanwhile, I was there with this lens, I knew microfiber pollution was an issue and that wasn't, those fibrous microparticles wasn't something I could necessarily see on that boat. So that same year I had decided to start my own consultancy and found Materievolve. Uh, at Materievolve, we develop regenerative textile systems through the lens of soil, sea and circularity. And this trip just confirmed it for me. Microfiber pollution was an area I really wanted to dig deep into and, and support uh, the, the solving of. Brilliant, and congratulations. Now, can you just dive a little bit deeper for us and explain what Materia Evolve does as a consultancy? Yeah, so we are a purpose-led business, mainly centered around two main functions. We provide project-based technical consulting with a variety of clientele, and we also build thoughtful experiential learning programming out in nature. We actually bring folks out of the office um, and in, in nature to have these discussions um, so we can really get to the creativity that nature inspires in all of us, as well as to the heart of what we're trying to do, solve with nature in mind. Well, I thought my original target client base would actually be brands and manufacturers, what I was very familiar with. It's expanded to many different entities that align with our mission to develop textile systems through the lens of soil, sea, and circularity. We've helped both small and large apparel companies develop their material strategy or develop fiber and feedstock forward textile programs. 
We've supported nonprofits in, in navigating challenges, the challenging textile industry landscape to develop new programs, catalyze action, and secure commitments. We have co-developed curriculum with academia at fashion and design schools on textile science and sustainability. We've even taken them out to see, uh, to have these conversations. And we've also supported government agencies through the work of workshop development, technical writing, and expert guidance specifically around the area of microfiber pollution. I love the idea of the experiences. We need more of that. We need more people in the fields or oceans, um, you know, just to see when you see it for yourself too, the visualization of a lot of these um, problems really hits you hard and sinks in. And, and also I think drives you, once you get educated, it's hard not to then want to drive action. So um, I think that's what we need next, an experience with you. <laughs> so let's Peter, do it. <laughs> I would love that. Now, Pizza, I'm very intrigued to hear more about your amazing exploration to the Arctic in 2016, where you took samples of the waters from 71 different stations. Now, you dub yourself Dr. Bad News, so I'm prepared for what you're going to share. But what led you to the Arctic in the first place? And were you originally intending to look for the differences between the eastern and western parts? Or was that a discovery you ended up making as a result of the trip? Well, thanks for that, Carrie. Uh, this is going back a few years, but I think one thing that's worth um, uh, worth um, uh, mentioning is the fact that microplastic science is actually reasonably recent. It was only in the early 2000s that uh, Richard Thompson and other scientists started looking for uh, structural pollutants uh, in, in water. So a lot has happened over the last 20 years. We've learned a lot uh, and we've grown a lot from the, the 1960s and 70s scourge of, you know, fishing nets, tangling up turtles and albatross and, and uh, you know, the debris and litter uh, uh, challenge that we saw in the 60s and 70s that we thought we solved. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, uh, into the 2000s, look under a microscope, we find these tiny particles everywhere. And so uh, with my work here uh, in the Pacific uh, or Northeastern Pacific Ocean, uh, we documented uh, 10 years ago now, fairly widespread distribution of microplastic particles uh, in, in the water column. And uh, secondly, that was taken up by, by zooplankton. So we started detecting and characterizing uh, these particles in the Northeastern Pacific, we had crews available in the Arctic on four different uh, ice-breaking vessels, uh, two uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada vessels, and, and two expeditions with a, a firm, an ecotourism firm called One Ocean Expeditions. And we established protocols and techniques uh, and trained uh, folks up uh, to be able to collect samples uh, in, in a comparable manner uh, throughout the Arctic. And so we ran on one cruise from Norway across the North Pole, uh, down through the central Canadian Arctic archipelago, and then into the Western Arctic and the Beaufort Sea. Uh, and then uh, another cruise uh, originating from Greenland, uh, heading west uh, in uh, the upper North Atlantic into the Arctic. Why did we do this? I think three things, maybe four. One, opportunity. Uh, there was a, a, a tremendous opportunity with large ice-breaking vessels with trained crews to be able to safely access a remote part of the world and collect samples of value to us in science. The second is the lesson we learned uh, in the 1980s and 1990s with POPs, persistent organic pollutants, like PCBs and DDT. Uh, we discovered that the Inuit, uh, living thousands of kilometers north uh, of industry in North America. We're actually the most contaminated people on the planet. And this was not because the Arctic was unduly contaminated, but because they were eating 25 times as much seafood and basically they're higher in the food chain than the average North American or European. That shocking uh, set of scientific studies led the way to the Stockholm Convention, which is a treaty uh, uh, signed into international law in 2004 that, ba that basically forces countries to eliminate those chemicals that are persistent and accumulate in food webs and can threaten uh, indigenous food webs. So that was a second reason to go to the Arctic. Do we have another pollutant that is ending up in a remote environment and may be a problem to indigenous consumers who are more co connected to natural or country foods? Um, the third was curiosity. 
um, having done a number of studies on microplastics and other pollutants in the North Pacific and elsewhere, I thought, well, as a scientist, wouldn't it be interesting to fill in a gap in terms of our knowledge and understanding of the transport of fate of microplastics uh, in our world? And the Arctic was a big uh, question mark. Some studies have been done that had detected them, but we were in a position to do a wide ranging study uh, of what was going on uh, in uh, throughout the Arctic. So basically, Carrie, what we found was uh, a little bit surprising in many ways or disappointing. First of all, basically detected in every single sample, 96 out of 97 samples. We found an average count of 90, 49 particles in every single cubic meter of seawater we sampled. We detected microplastics down one kilometer in the Beaufort Sea. That's one over a thousand meters depth in the Beaufort Sea. 73% of our particles were polyester, uh, averaging 11 to 14 microns. And so very consistent, as mentioned a little bit earlier, with uh, polyester textiles uh, through laundry and wastewater, uh, delivering these, uh, these particles into our ocean. And then the the discovery was not planned for or anticipated, uh, Carrie. We found that the levels of microplastic and microfibers were three times higher in the Eastern Arctic, close to the North Atlantic, than in the Western Arctic. The fibers were longer in the Eastern uh, Arctic than in the Western Arctic by about 50%. And the fibers in the Eastern Arctic, closer to the North Atlantic, were fresher newer. We were able to basically show that fibers as they move from east to west became shorter, they were breaking down into smaller pieces, and they were becoming weathered uh, uh, in terms of the chemistry of, of the, of the uh, particle. Everything pointed to the North Atlantic introducing large quantities of microfibers into the Arctic environment and then having them uh, move around with ocean currents. Um, and so I think uh, what this does is it points to the prospect, unfortunately, of laundry and wastewater, municipal wastewater, mm -hmm. uh, releasing uh, these contaminants into the Atlantic Ocean and then having the Atlantic Ocean deliver those uh, up through uh, the straits into the Arctic. And um, that was the end of that story. Gosh, it's so insightful and uh Yes, why well you you know what you do deliver and find out all the problems, but at the same time too, it like I said, this is so insightful, and these statistics are almost in a way unreal to hear, you know, and and what you're discovering, and I'm sure the audience here, especially those hearing this for the first time, are probably a little shocked on what is actually happening and what we are doing in our waters when we actually just think we're going about our day, like you know. We, we think we're doing a little bit better, but then you hear things like this and it's absolutely shocking. Now, was there, I just want to ask one, you answered a lot there that you just shared with us, but was there more evidence of why these differed so much from the East to West? Well, the in terms of ocean currents, a lot more water enters the Arctic uh, Ocean from the Atlantic than from the Pacific, uh, and I think just the uh, the European and North American uh, seaboards uh, have you know high population abundance, large densities of people, uh, and uh, you know the textiles uh, that are used and washed uh, and or disposed of in uh, Europe and North America are basically releasing these into the North Atlantic. So very consistent with the fact that the Atlantic uh, has uh, ocean currents that are basically mixing uh, mm -hmm. these large quantities of uh, microfibers up and then releasing them through ocean currents that are well established uh, into the Arctic. Um, it might be worth pointing out that um, we estimated a few years ago that the average North American household is discharging over 500 million microfibers uh, every single year from laundry. Uh, it's 500 million per household. Uh, most uh, in Europe and North America on, are on uh, secondary wastewater treatment plant. Uh, probably 80% of people or households are, are serviced by wastewater treatment plants. We know that those plants retain uh, a lot of uh, microplastic particles and microfibers, but still a lot evade and get through into the liquid effluent. And then a lot of those biosolids that are retained by the wastewater treatment plant 
are subsequently used uh, in, uh, in agriculture, forestry, and uh, land reclamation projects, meaning we're simply redistributing the microfibers on the terrestrial environment, at which point they're, they're going to be released into streams, rivers, and, and ultimately into the ocean. So the story, I think, uh, of our Arctic research connects our very homes and our lifestyles and our consumer choices in wearing polyester uh, clothing uh, that sheds fibers as we launder them uh, and as we wear them. Uh, and that uh, regrettably connects us with the contamination of a very remote part of our very small planet. Uh, and it's something that is likely to be troublesome and of uh, considerable concern when it comes to uh, indigenous consumers of seafoods uh, in the Arctic uh, and along any other coastline in the world. Thank you so much, Peter. And there's a lot to um, digest there, but I think one important thing is, is to remember, like you just said, it's all connected and we are connected and it is a small planet and the choices that we make in one region are actually affecting many others negatively. So Amanda, over to you. Now, sometimes an innovation means a disruption to the supply chain chain because the innovation quite often doesn't fit into the manufacturer's existing structure and especially their production facilities. It means changes to their infrastructure and the reality is we all hear this in the space, it's going to be unaffordable for them. So when you look at the MTIX and the MLSE system, what does that mean and how might it work easier and even solve problems for the manufacturer and maybe even help them reduce costs? Yeah, so that's a that is a really important point about any new solution is um, how disruptive is it in um, in the long term in terms of cost and oftentimes the manufacturers have the smallest profit margins of anyone up and down the supply chain and, and the raw materials chain and so it is very important to to kind of think think realistically. Um, about, about about how we can put a put change in place. Um, one thing just to bring up quickly as I see some questions here about you know why are we not using bio-based materials instead of synthetics. And I, I guess I should first point out that we as a brand and as a kind of um, the fashion industry in general is attempting to move more towards 100% bio-based solutions. And we definitely believe that that is uh, the way of the future. But there are still a lot of performance characteristics which have only been developed in synthetics. And you know we love our athleisure gear and our <laughs> high performance textiles. And before you know we're in process of building up those uh, performance characteristics in bio-based textiles. But realistically, this is a big, huge problem now, and we we need some intermediary solutions for you know the existing synthetics out there. And also keeping in mind that we do want to continue to recycle the uh, the the synthetic textiles that we already have in production. And this is something that we can use on recycled uh, synthetics as well. So in terms of actually putting MTIX into production, um, the model is that it can actually be, be placed into a factory and be a multi-purpose machine. And this is key, right? Every factory has, um, you know, does treatment, all, all these kind of invisible treatments that you don't even know are potentially happening um, to your textile, right? So there's there's a whole process of preparing things for dye, then the dye process itself. There's different finishing techniques. And each one of these can be like multi-step, multi-machines. And one thing that the MTX system can do is actually you know, put that all into one, uh, one machine. So if you think about the analog is like, this machine is like the mainframe computer and we're writing new algorithms and new code to develop different treatments. So fire retardancy, water repellency, and these can all be done simultaneously with one, um, with one run through the machine or sometimes two, but it can be double-sided. There's a lot of things you can do at once, which saves, of course, water, energy, et cetera. So, so this is really the model. And also they've created a model where the machines can be basically leased so they don't have to be a, a huge upfront purchase um, for the manufacturer itself. And, and this is um, really about how can we find the right kinds of collaboration? So for example, MTX it has a new project that just launched in, um, in Amsterdam, it's um, with Circotex. And this is the cleanest, uh, most sustainable dye factory in the world. It's, it's almost entirely dry. They're working with a, a dye technology called Daiku. And this microfiber treatment is one step of, of the dyeing process, right? So you're putting it into um, something that we already know needs to happen to the textile. Um, and, and then we can actually start to, um, start to kind of have multi-purpose 
um, um, treatments, which you know save time and money. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, at the Future Fabrics Expo, um, which it takes place in London in June, um, we'll be showing off um, the MTX technology and launching a kind of project consortium challenge of our own to get brands to come together to kind of put a certain amount of, of meters of textile um, through the microfiber uh, mitigation process. And we need so that, so that brands can basically start to work together to make to scale this, to make it more affordable, to have more machines um, and, and sort of coming together to kind of utilize one of these machines collectively is also really key in, um, in making it um, affordable and um, easy to integrate into the manufacturing process. Yeah, key elements there becomes around all these partnerships. And so really looking forward to hearing about how this coalition goes and congratulations for the upcoming launch for that. Um, now, Crystal, you and your colleague, Caroline Box, were selected by the Environmental Protection Agency's Trash Free Waters Program and NOAA's Marine Debris Program to author the Save Our Seas Act 2.0. And this is a report on microfiber pollution for the interagency Marine Debris Coordinating Committee. I hope everybody got that. That is a big <laughs> deal. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Um, and I'm sure we can share a link or resources or to that afterwards. But um, what's super exciting here is it's actually a first of its kind, right, at a state or federal level solely focused on microfibers. So, Crystal, can you tell us more about what this report is? What does it include? And especially, I want to hear about its goals and then your contribution to the report, please. Sure. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, it's it's exactly what our country needs. And I was really excited to be a part of it. Um, just wanted to emphasize we were co-authors along with EPA's Trash Free Waters Program, NOAA's Marine Debris Program. And really part of our role was implementing a process that also allowed for multiple federal agencies under the Interagency Marine Debris Coordinating Committee to participate and add their own feedback based on what we were able to, to collect and put together. Um, we also built a process to bring in and identify an expert advisory committee. So we actually had um, multiple scientists, uh, folks from industry, um, bringing in the current and, and most relevant research for microfiber pollution into that report um, actually, one of co colleagues, one of the colleagues of Peter Ross was part of that um, expert advisory committee, Anna Posaka. Um, the SOS 2.0 report on microfiber pollution was developed by EPA's Trash Free Water Programs and NOAA's Marine Debris Program on behalf of the IMDCC. Carolyn and I served as co-authors. Um, that report was actually required by law in the Save Our Seas Act 2.0. Um, the report will and does provide the United States Congress with an overview of the microfiber pollution issue, while also outlining a path forward for federal agencies in partnership with other stakeholders to address the problem. Included in the report are a definition of microfiber, which actually does include treated natural and um, uh, human-made cellulosics, not just plastic fibers. Um, an assessment of the sources, prevalence, and causes of microfiber pollution, a recommendation for the standardized methodology to measure and estimate the prevalence of microfiber pollution, recommendations for reducing microfiber pollution, and a plan for how federal agencies, in partnership with other, their stakeholders, can lead on opportunities to reduce microfiber pollution. The report has already gone through a public comment process, which we supported in reviewing and integrating those comments, and it's currently in its very, very, very last final stage review. Um, our colleagues at NOAA and EPA expect that report to be submitted to Congress early this year. So really being first of its kind, it'll be the first sort of overview of microfiber pollution and what to do about it that, that we will see at a federal level. This is critical work. I cannot wait to see what comes of this and when this comes out. And uh, I can only imagine the amount of uh, collaboration and brain power that has had to go to drive something like this. So thank 
you. Now, Peter, in 2015, you were one of the first people to discover that microfibers are being ingested by plankton, specifically in two foundation species in the North Pacific. Why is this so important? And can you talk about the kind of harm microfibers can cause? And I know that there's an accompanying slide um, so we can visualize some of this too. Thanks, Kerry. Um, I outlined a little bit earlier how in the 1960s and 70s, uh, many in the public realm were uh, fixated and, and disturbed by visual uh, you know, uh, images of sea turtles and whales and seals and albatross, either uh, with their stomachs full of content, uh, stomachs full of uh, plastics, or tangled up in, in nets and debris. And so there was a major threat, in some case, a conservation threat to entire populations of albatross uh, or monk seals or uh, some of the sea, sea turtle species that, that uh, we, we know and love. Uh, and so this um, raised a question for me when we started seeing microplastics um, in uh, different scientific studies and in our coastal environments. And so we said, well, you know, uh, zooplankton are at the bottom of the food chain in the Pacific Ocean or any ocean for that matter. They're relied upon in abundance uh, by everyone above them in the food chain from, uh, from forage fish to predatory fish, including salmon, tuna, swordfish, uh, as well as marine mammals, including uh, pinnipeds, so seals, sea lions, and walrus. Uh, and then up into uh, the cetaceans, notably those cetaceans that filter feed, uh, like gray whales or humpback whales uh, or right whales. But um, as you go up the food chain, typically you're losing energy. You're seeing more and more in the way of persistent contaminants. But uh, the, the message, I think, underlying ocean productivity is the fact that you need phytoplankton and zooplankton to be producing that foundational supply of nutrients and energy to feed the rest of the food, food web above them. So when we went out, uh, uh, out to a thousand kilometers offshore here in southern BC, just on the border with Washington State, we collected two species of uh, zooplankton that are critically important to the bottom of the food chain here. So Euphausia pacifica and Neocalinus cristata. And we found microplastics in both species and virtually in every single sample. Uh, and we found the concentration to be higher uh, in those individuals um, in the inland waters between Vancouver Island uh, and the mainland of British Columbia. So we found that zooplankton were in fact mistaking microplastic for food. And interestingly, uh, the zooplankton would seem to prefer fibers because the fibers resembled the algae that they relied on naturally. So when you have colorful fibers that look like food um, uh, and they might have a little bit of biofilm on them, to make them a little bit more tasty, you consume that food. Number one, it offers zero nutrition, let's be clear. Uh, so those who argue that you've got no evidence that it's harming zooplankton, let's just remember that these are synthetic petrochemicals that are not delivering any nu nutritional value. That's, that's a, a, a non-starter. Secondly, they can obstruct the gut. Uh, and we've seen artificial satiation or obstruction leading to death, certainly in turtles uh, and in albatross out at Midway Atoll uh, for a number of years. We know that plastics can ob obstruct the gut. And in the case of, of uh, zooplankton, uh, the same is very likely to be true. Um, the third thing, uh, and we don't know as much about this, but third thing is that the microplastics and the synthetic fibers can deliver toxic chemicals to those that consume them. I know there's been a lot of concern about such chemicals as uh, flame retardant compounds or forever chemicals, PFAS, uh, or uh, dyes, hardening agents, softening agents that are added to plastics to give them the, the end consumer product that uh, is sold and available for us as consumers. So lots of concerns about the harmful, the potential for harmful effects. Uh, we don't know as much about that, but let's put the category of risk into two bins. Number one, uh, chemical associated toxicity, endocrine disruption, and number two, structural toxicity, where that, uh, that item, that fiber, that particle uh, can suffocate uh, or obstruct 
or artificially satiate an animal uh, and uh, reduce its fitness and potentially uh, cause acute mortality. So that's what we're worried about. And I think that's what our study did in 2014 and 2015 is establish that uh, it's not just charismatic wildlife at the top of the food chain that have been threatened by plastic. It's also the less charismatic, but very, very important, foundationally important species at the bottom of the food chain that are mistaking microfibers for food. This is incredible. And you continue to share such staggering insights. And um, it, it, it's, it's just incredible. And there's so much to take in. And I think what would be wonderful, too, is if the comment section, again, if there's any links or websites or sources where you think people can go to learn more, I think that would be extremely helpful. Now, we don't have much time left, but I would love to briefly move through these next round of questions so that we can also get to some audience um, questions, if that's OK. So Amanda, you're not only selling apparel at Pangaea, but you also have a B2B channel. Why do you share your products with other companies? And what would sharing MTIX look like? How does all of yeah. this work? So it's often surprising to people because in fashion, there's often this focus on exclusivity. And that's really antithetical to the entire process of innovation. So this is where my background in tech comes into play and thinking about how our business model was formed. Um, you know, th th this idea of the Intel inside model, right, where you can be the person that uh, makes the product, but you can also be the person that the company that makes all the materials, the quality materials that go into everybody else's product. And of course, that's actually a much bigger market. Um, <laughs> and, and the other thing is that, you know, as we are selling our consumer uh, goods, you know, direct to consumer, um, every, you know, a portion of the, you know, the profits from that go back into our research to move forward these other innovations, right? So this is this kind of innovation cycle, which is um, just hasn't really quite made it into the fashion industry as much as it should, because, you know, textiles are incredibly technical and fashion is often seen as just kind of more in the glamorous non-engineering um, part of the world. But this, this is, this is something that is quite crucial to push innovation forward. We also need the innovations to scale to bring the price points down. And that's where, you know, sharing across multiple brands is also incredibly um, crucial because we, we're never going to have that or, or we don't, we're not even aiming to be the most giant brand in the world. What we want to do is have a lot of different aesthetics uh, coming from various different brands, but we can be the quality materials that go into creating the things about fashion that we love. Um, and so, and so this, this part of, of the, of the process of actually being able to, to share the new materials across the the industry is what really um will will push change we, we need to speed everything up <laughs> as quickly as possible scale and volume right like that's yeah. what we're looking at yeah. to, for not that we're trying to make more clothes but better clothes well, scale the solution. exactly we need to scale the solutions um is yeah. what I'm referencing. Now, uh, Crystal, I'm just going to move over to you for a question, but I did want to share that speakers, while I'm not talking to you, if you want to share your contact, whether it's your social links and things like that in the comments, the viewers are asking how they can follow your work. So please do. Now, Crystal, having come from a performance outdoor focused background, you have a deep understanding of why materials are made the way they are and their benefits. You've even said that there's a reason why cotton is in a lot of our wardrobes because of its moisture capacity and the performance characteristics that it has. Do you generally advise your clients to invest in natural fibers? Yes, and is the Thank simple you. answer to that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I do think with where we are in our materials portfolio as an industry, um, it would be really hard to switch to all natural fibers tomorrow. I think first and foremost, overconsumption is an issue that we need to address. Overconsumption and overproduction, sorry, production being the key. Um, we have made a lot of beautiful apparel and clothing uh, previous to the fast fashion era, and that should be rotated and, and not gone to waste. Um, but also cotton, wool, hemp, cashmere, alpaca, linen, leather, and even the world of human-made cellulosics like Tencel and Modal and a lot of the the new recycled uh, cellulosics we're seeing have an important performance role to play in our wardrobes as well. We are adding additional chemistry to polyester to give it a cooling effect or prevent microbial growth that encourages odor or resist UV radiation. 
do we need to do that? Or, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of wearing merino wool base layers or tencel merino if it's a little hot outside for a sweaty activity. Um, I love cotton, hemp, and linen for most days here in California, obviously climate specific. But I really think that that thinking about polyester in our performance apparel as the primary material is, is an old way of thinking. Um, and I do think there are a lot of whole systems, bio-based materials that are thinking about addressing the issues like microfiber pollution, as well as greenhouse gas emissions and inputs that are going into their material, things like Kintra and mango materials. I'm um, really thinking about the end of life it, at the beginning of the materials design um, and giving us an opportunity as an industry to support whole systems change and not just the idea of phasing out of fossil fuel based plastics, but thinking about persistence and toxicity and impact on wildlife as we design the systems from the beginning. Yeah, end of life in mind for the beginning. Wouldn't that be just game changing for the fashion industry? Now, Peter, and I love this, um, how we're about to come pair you over at Earth Day is we think you're like the Rachel Carson of the open ocean. <laughs> and so you have been relentless with your tracking, your experimenting, your cataloging, the scientific information on man-made toxic elements in the ocean, and the list goes on. But now we know that microfibers carry the many toxic chemicals that they've been treated with during processing, and that they also are picking up other free floating toxins in the ocean. And these in turn, as you've showed us, even in the short time we're here together, they're actually ingested by marine life. Now, should we only be concerned about the structural damage caused by microfibers to say the zooplankton and the shellfish? Or are you concerned about the chemicals microfibers as they carry? and the implications for their health and by extension, our health? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, we're counting on research to continue, for science to continue. We need original creative researchers to be out there in the environment, to be in their labs, to be looking at uh, what these uh, very complex um, uh, uh, mixtures uh, might do to wildlife, to, to our seafood, to our uh, environment, and to uh, human health. And to the two dualities of toxic risk, my, my overwhelming concern at present is that the structural toxicity can, can cause problems. Uh, structural toxicity to me means microfibers can kill small creatures like zooplankton. They get into uh, larger organisms, they can cause inflammation of the gut. Uh, they can, uh, in smaller forms, they can break down and cross uh, into the bloodstream and into uh, the brain or into our uh, organs. So there's lots of uh, emerging evidence now that as a structural pollutant, microfibers and microplastics are killing or are damaging uh, the health of uh, those that consume them. In terms of toxicity, uh, there are studies out there that show, number one, uh, that chemicals associated with microfibers and microplastics can be lost or taken up by, uh, by organisms that consume them. And a lot of these chemicals, as you point out, are problematic. They're endocrine disrupting. Think of bisphenol A, BPA. We've long heard about BPA as an estrogen. So we've got a lot of artificial hormones or endocrine disrupting compounds that are deliberately added to plastics and into textiles that may be a problem uh, for consumers and certainly for public health. So I think the, the very fact that we're finding microfibers uh, in every sample we look at all over the planet uh, and that some of those fibers have uh, deliberately added uh, compounds that are of uh, concern to human health or the health of wildlife is problematic because what it means is we're, we're basically carrying out a global experiment on what this might do to the health of people or to the health of uh, our, our planet. And so that global experiment is continuing and we're publishing, we're observing what is, uh, what is happening. Uh, but I think uh, we have sufficient evidence that both the structural harm and the potential for toxicity associated with chemicals means the precautionary uh, ammunition that we have uh, in place is ample. We are concerned about microplastics, microfibers, 
and we should be acting on them. We have many solutions. We've been hearing about several today. Those solutions are many fold at different levels along the, the production, the design production and consumption phase. Uh, and uh, we really need all hands on deck to deliver solutions at each one of these steps in order to reduce ultimately uh, the, the uh, abundance of these particles in our environment. Thank you so much, Peter. Now, just for the sake of time, I've got this last question here that I'm going to open to all three of you, actually, then I would love to move over to um, some audience questions. Now, each of you today have actually spoke about the disconnect between impact and fashion and innovation. And I think when we look at this, it's fashion doesn't have any internal R&D and science doesn't do fashion. And so really I'd call to all three of you, but Amanda, I'm going to start with you. What can be done to bring science and fashion together to tackle the problems that fashion has created? Yeah, so I think I've been sort of touching on this uh, along the way, but um, this idea of the recognition that the textile industry is very technical and part of the tech world, that should be the first thing. I think that's a historical problem and potentially gendered, you know, fashion as a woman's art and craft and not engineering as a male, <laughs> something male and technical. So kind of, you know, moving, moving towards that. Um, and then um, in general, I think that the more that we understand how things are made. And that I think I love, you know, thinking about what teenagers know about, um, you know, about their clothes. And it's it's very encouraging, right? That the things that they're kind of getting into and understanding everything about environmentalism and and the recognition of the of the kind of impact that they have. Um, I think that that is, is also just something that's great to make it more, feel ho more holistic that clothes are part of the entire product life cycle of everything we manufacture and um, and just have, have just as many impacts. So yeah, that's. Crystal? Yeah, uh, we really believe that Material Evolve that getting folks out of the office and thinking out of the box out in nature to talk about these environmental issues out on the farm to talk about soil health and soil to soil textile systems out on a boat in the San Francisco Bay to talk about microfiber pollution, green chemistry, and, and toxicity. A lot of what we're covering today is, is how we can get diverse groups to really level set and, and realize that there's language and translation of science that doesn't always translate really easily, and that we're all not trying to harm the earth in what we're doing, but, but try to translate those learnings from science into industry. I love, Amanda, your point about just acknowledging that textiles are a science. Often, you know, when I say I'm a textile scientist, people are like, a what? That, that, oh, that, that's a role? <laughs> as a fashion scientist, I've like invented that term for myself, which is, I mean, it's great. It gets teenage girls excited, though, I got to say. <laughs> Yeah, I, and, and what it is, is it's all an art and a science, and we really have to balance the masculine and the feminine aspects to it all and realize that we want to wear our values, but we also don't want to harm any living systems in the process of doing that. And so, um, yeah, we really think experiential learning is, is a, a powerful tool uh, and invite anyone on the call to join us, any organization who's interested. We've got... Um, a textile ocean connector program sale, something we do annually every year in San Francisco Bay on September 27th this year. We typically have six expert speakers. I think most of them were PhDs last year. <laughs> um, just to sort of pepper in these different topics we're all thinking about um, on policy, on um, science, on material solutions, technology. Um, and so we really invite folks to come out. We're looking for sponsors and, and people interested in joining us on the boat. So um, that's on our website and I'll make sure that gets in our comments before the end of the program. Great. Uh, yeah. And also just to um, say with the speakers, you'll see here the, the comments box where you can add your contact details um, where you see the audience questions too. Peter, anything to add to this uh, before I go over to audience Q&A? You're good. I would just say that um, I, 
I'm I'm not concerned that there's not enough innovation out there. We've heard today and we we hear in our own realms that there are plenty of innovators. There's some very exciting conversations. There are some wonderful combinations of science, design, manufacturing, uh, and and so forth um, underway right now. Lots of partnerships, lots of forums. Um, what I do say though is we need strong leadership. It's very hard to protect the commons when we don't have leadership. And leadership means everyone's got to have uh, uh, be invited to a level playing field. If 50% of the textiles being produced globally have a sustainability model and 50% are the budget model that are basically uh, losing uh, millions of fibers every time they're, they're laundered, we're not going to save the ocean. So we need strong leadership, whether be it regulations, be it standards, be it trade agreements and so forth. And we need buy-in for that. The second thing is we need a team. We need teamwork. We need people to be working together from all, all sectors and all sides. Uh, and that creates the buzz, the innovation, the fun um, and, and so forth. Um, and the third thing I'd say is, uh, and people in chat have asked about recycling. What do we do with end of life textiles? Regrettably, the recycling sector is way behind in terms of opportunities for, for the creation of aftermarket uh, products. But beware, uh, closing the loop on the textile economy is going to be very, very difficult if we're going to use that mantra to compel us to continue along this polyester journey that, that, uh, that we're on right now. Closing the loop on the polyester textile sector is gonna be exceedingly difficult, a bit of a pipe dream, a bit of a red herring, I think for the very uh, tangible and notable alternatives uh, as we've heard from both Crystal and Amanda today. So um, just a few thoughts, thanks. No, thank you to all three of you. Now, Peter and Amanda, I know you've picked up on a few of the comments and addressed them um, from the audience, but one I'd like to share to all three of you, and please, whoever wishes to answer that, let me know. Bree asks, do you think the demand for sustainable clothing, including materials that might not shed microfibers, is coming from consumers? Or, or is it brand's fear of regulations? Which is the dominant force? Some say consumer demand is not that strong. Who wants to jump in with this first? Um, I'll, I'll take a tackle out of being on the brand side. So I think that, you know, there's a difference between what people say they want to do and what they do. There's the psychology of that. So uh, people definitely say that they want to buy more sustainable things. And it's just, it really comes down to, does it cost more or where your values are at? And also there was a sort of a, historically, a lot of sustainable clothing was not very stylish. And, you know, people want, fashion is a means of personal expression and you want to put on something that you feel good in. And that's, that's really key. So I always say that, you know, the most sustainable product is the one that you don't even know it's sustainable, that people just want to buy it because it's a great product that they love. And that's kind of what we try to shoot for. Um, you know, people say sometimes when they wear our track suits, it's like, Oh, you've ruined the rest of my wardrobe. I don't want to put on anything else. It's, I think it's really about getting people to kind of fall in love with the quality and have things that they do want to continue to wear. So this kind of opposite of, of that. But I think the re the fear of regulation is also a very real thing. And I think it's coming in Europe, it's coming a lot faster than I think a lot, a lot of brands are panicking. And one of the thing with our B2B is that we, you know, every textile we sell has end of life studies, impact studies, the certification, et cetera, which allows. So there's this point of like you buy a textile that has connected data and analysis with it that becomes uh, suddenly that is cheaper than um, trying to do it yourself to comply with a regulation or right for getting um, getting taxed or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I think it's it's coming from from both ends. But not fast enough. Thank <laughs> you for that. There's no speed. Now, it's also asked here, but what do we do about clothing that cannot be donated? Can anybody speak to that? Sounds like we all wish we had a good solution for this. Um, I, I think, you know, I've explored this a lot with just my general community. I think what people don't realize is the systems that are already set up. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of folks think like, oh, I don't think this is valuable enough to go through a Goodwill, for example. When Goodwill actually has created a system, particularly here in San Francisco, where they are sorting for quality and finding secondary markets based on that quality. So there may be, um, 
And, but I also think that wish recycling should not happen either. So there, there is some education that could happen and systems improvement overall. Um, but I do think I've encountered a lot of folks within my community that are like, this just, this doesn't make sense to go to Goodwill because it has a hole or whatever, but they're actually sorting some of that into secondary markets that allow that to be mechanically recycled into cotton, used as janitorial rags, at least give it one more life. Um, so that's just something to note. And I would look into your local recyclers, your your uh, Salvation Armies, your, you know, small secondhand folks, or even, you know, I've found a lot of great um, tools through Poshmark and, and these other amazing services that allow you to find people who are willing to take a Patagonia or North Face jacket that has a little wear because they don't want to spend $600 on their next jacket and it'll work great for them. I think also this is sort of a question of, you know, the, the thinking about the end of life when you do buy something. I mean, one of the things that we try to to say as well, you know, worst case scenario, if our clothing ends up in landfill, like if our, you know, some of our, our, our organic cotton pesticide free, you know, it's not, that's not where it should be, but it's not going to do any damage. So first off, like the textiles, just the ones that you have in your wardrobe and that you, if they do accidentally end up somewhere, just make sure that they're not doing the harm that especially like cheap fast fashion polyester does. So. Thank you for that. Now I'm going to bring up a last question here from Joshua that, um, and I hear this often, so it, especially people that are new to this conversation. So I'd love to hear your insights here. He shares, years ago, people got along today, sorry, got along without today's synthetics in its clothes. Is there a way to make these clothes with natural materials instead of synthetics that might be just as good? The answer is uh, yes and, or yes, but. <laughs> so um, from th this is definitely, there's so many amazing startups out there that are that are having all sorts of bio-based um, you know, performance alternatives, biosynthetics. It's a huge, um, you know, new area of research and we're all, you know, kind of aligned that we want to get this out there. We're starting to, you know, we're bringing out, um, you know, we have some bio-based, act, you know, active wear, which is really the holy grail is all about getting, 100% bio-based spandex um, and lycra. Um, so it's coming, it's slow, it's expensive. Um, and so that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, I will say one of the things that I find interesting about this space is that a lot of our materials are over-designed, meaning that you don't need like a super high performance thing. And, you know, you, there's one jacket that can be for trekking, you know, <laughs> and there's like a reason why it needs to be that high performance, but there's can also be, uh, you know, a kind of compromise of, this is comfortable and performance enhanced enough. So I'm sort of anti having 5,000 treatments on, you know, on, you know, because you can, you can have a cotton and then you can make it toxic with all these treatments. So I think that it's really thinking about what do we need? You know, what is the material appropriateness for the use of that garment? And so I'm trying to encourage less, <laughs> less functionality sometimes for, you know, for, for new materials. And, you know, that's, it shouldn't be a marketing thing to have 17 different add-ons. Yeah, I've no. seen that. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Crystal. I was just going to tack on, I've seen that a lot in my career. When you think about the jacket that's designed to get the athlete to Everest being purchased by a lot of people who are walking their dogs, like, do we need the high level of performance every time for, for that item? Um, and, and the question to that is no. And that helping us guide things like the integration of green chemistry, this whole issue around PFAS that Potter, that Peter brought up. Um, you know, initially when we were exploring green chemical alternatives to PFAS, there was fear of regulation, but not enough fear to move industry until we had regulation um, because we just weren't seeing the same level of performance from those green, green chemical alternatives and that transition in the manufacturing side was really hard because they were so used to using this chemistry for decades that was so easy to get the performance we were looking for. And it, even performance we weren't looking for, oil repellency. We weren't ever advertising that to the consumer, but they were getting that from PFOS. And now with these green chemical alternatives, you're not necessarily getting that, but how much oil repellency do you really need for that salad dressing that drops on your jacket while you're eating with friends at brunch? Um, so it's just, it's that over-engineering concept and really thinking about the purpose behind not only the performance of the product, but all the people and living systems that are involved in the development of that product. 
I was just going to say that Thank consumers you. want functionality. The consumers want functionality. They don't necessarily, uh, that doesn't give industry uh, carte blanche to use thousands of different chemical products and, uh, and other compounds to, to go into uh, the design and production of garment. There are over 14,000 different perfluoroalkyl substances on the market. That's PFAS. Think of Scotchgard. People remember the old Scotchgard that 3M got rid of, but it still exists. It's still out there. Over 14,000 of them. So that's creating a functionality that industry is espousing, but we don't necessarily need that functionality or we don't use, need to use chemicals to support that functionality. There are lots of uh, much more sustainable uh, recipes. And the other thing to note is that industry, and we've got to be careful here, industry often says, well, the consumers are voting for this or that or, or this. Uh, and yet the consumer is completely oblivious to the many thousands of different mm -hmm. chemicals that are on the market and or used in textiles uh, or the manufacturing sector. And it's really unfair to default to the lowest common denominator, which is the average member of public going into Walmart or to a store uh, to purchase an item. It, it, they can't, simply cannot have the know-how, the expertise to understand what they're buying. Uh, and so that I think that goes back to corporate responsibility, Mm -hmm. and leadership. And it goes back to, hey, whether it's standards or trade agreements or regulations, we need leadership in government and in industry to make sure yes. that what the consumer gets is transparent. It's understandable. Uh, it's deemed to be safe. There's a bit of a precautionary uh, mantra uh, used to uh, to create that um you know, that product that is not going to be harming the environment. So that, and, and unfortunately, the complex in the textile sector is contaminating uh, mm -hmm. the next product should you be able to recycle it. So adulterating the primary product uh, with flame retardant, estrogenic chemicals, or hardening agents, or softening agents, means it's not going to be fit uh, as a secondary recycled product that is safe for public health. So making sure that we design, if we're going to use plastic, making sure that we design that plastic such that it is safe and marketable uh, in its afterlife. That's going to be very important. Wow. Well, the time has come where I need to unfortunately wrap up this conversation. It has been beyond an honor to spend um, this last hour and a bit with all three of you. So much learning, so much insight, and I'm actually not sure what conversation could spark my brain any more this week than the three of you have. So I hope the audience have learned a lot. And um, just a huge thank you, not only just for your time here, but the relentless work that you are doing. Um, it, it's absolutely incredible and the industry needs it. And, and let's be honest, society at whole, because it benefits from all of this research. So thank you. Um, big thank you to everyone joining us in the audience. I know there was a lot more Q&A coming through. Um, You'll be able to watch this on the other channels as well as we're able to connect with our speakers. Um, Shelley, I would love to hand over back to you to um, wrap up for us. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. And I, this has been truly an enlightening webinar. Um, I am really grateful to all of our guests for their valuable time and sharing their amazing work with all of us. Um, just on one last note, Earth Day is a very big supporter of the Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act, which is better known as the Fashion Act. This bill sits today before the legislatures in Albany. It's enormously important because this $2.5 trillion fashion industry is almost entirely unregulated. If you're a New York State resident, we urge you to write to your representatives in Albany and implore them to sponsor this bill and to vote for its passage. Thanks also today to Megan McAstocker of the Public Foundation and Valentina Marshik of the United Nations Fashion and Lifestyle Network. Thanks also to Timothy McDermott and Catherine Bruchowski at Earth Day headquarters in Washington, DC. And finally, thank you to everyone who has tuned in here today.